Okay, Penn State fans, Bob Flounders, Johnny McGonigal. The weather has been great. It's Wednesday, a little, little before noon as we're going to record this blue-white breakdown. Johnny, we were up at practice uh, on Tuesday. It was almost 80 degrees. It's going to be probably 70 today. I don't know that the blue-white game, it might be a little chilly or windy on Saturday, but no rain. I'm excited. The big day sort of big day is finally here how are you doing we've almost made it through spring practices we were up there for another long tuesday you had a nice little long ride up you're gonna have a long ride back so you're a trooper how are you holding up and i real quick before and also as a combo when you were when you covered pit for the post gazette can you just tell the penn state fans what was it like covering maybe a pit spring compared to like a Penn State spring under James Franklin? Ooh, that's a lot, Bob. So I'll start with, I'll start, yeah, it is with, a lot. I'll start with how I'm doing. I'm doing well. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the easy part out of the way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're recording this Wednesday morning. Uh, it's been a busy morning for me, Bob. I had to get on the pre-sale for the Liverpool preseason game that's being played in Pittsburgh. In had to. An excuse to go back to Pittsburgh. Uh, I, I missed the Philly pre-sale. Probably will be buying third market on that one to go to oh. the games. But up the Reds. Um, <laughs> no, no. It's been a busy couple days, though, Bob. Because, yeah, I, I got up here, yeah. uh, here Monday night because, you know, Tuesday morning I was at the Morgan Academic Center, which is attached to the Lash Building, set up in a conference room uh, for some one-on-one -on -one interviews uh, with uh, some sit-downs with Drew Aller, Julian Fleming, new offensive coordinator, Andy kotal Nikki. some really good stuff from all three of those and, uh, and bigger stories on those three coming in the weeks ahead. Uh, so Penn Live readers, keep an eye out for those. Um, and then we had practice and then we had interviews and mm -hmm. yes, Bob Spring is coming to, uh, to an end this weekend with the blue white game. And uh, yeah, it's been a, it's been a, I don't even want to say, you know, eventful or, you know, there's been some news. There's been some, obviously some developments with the transfers in, there's going to be transfers out very mm -hmm. shortly. Uh, the portal opens again on April 16th, which is next Tuesday, something that we'll be discussing uh, as we move along. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And then to answer, to answer the pit end of it. Um, yeah. You know, there was a little bit more access uh, from what I remember uh, in terms of just number of practices that we were able to, to get to, um, but, you know, Penn State gets us, you know, they get us James and they get us an assistant yeah, coach sure. and, and a few players every week. So, yep. yeah, no, no. I just was wondering, like, did, Nar did Pat Narduzzi, could you watch practice at Pitt? And what was, I mean, there are, there are some, there's some restrictions in place for, for the Penn State viewing. But I was just curious, like, what, how, how, I, I don't think the, the, the pit beat was is quite as big as the Penn State beat, but I didn't know how long you could watch practice and and what the rules were like there. Yeah, yeah, the the, the window was longer. Uh, from what I remember, it might have been 20, 25 minutes. Uh, you know, again, that was it was like three, four years ago now, so it's it's kind of tough to. I think I think it was like 20, 25 minutes, and uh, I think we were afforded maybe ten minutes last night. Um, yeah. My math was right if I was looking at my clock right. Uh, so, yeah, you got to see a little bit more and you, you got a, a little bit better of an understanding of of who's positioned where in terms of uh, not only positions, literally, because you got guys changing positions, but, you know, where they're at in the in the early, early depth chart, because it yeah. is still April. There's a lot of position battles that will be yeah. won in August. But um, but yeah. Yeah. So. um so with the the Penn State availability, the, this was the last availability before the the blue white game. Penn State fans, in case you haven't heard, the blue white game is Saturday, two o'clock. Admission is free. The parking lots open at eight. They're gonna they're gonna zonk you for some money if you want to park. I think, but uh, the game will be on the blue white no the Big Ted Network, the blue white network. What am I saying? I think we're going to see the Blue White Breakdown. Are we going to live podcast throughout the Blue White break? Yeah, we're going to live podcast it while we're tailgating. That should be fun. Yeah, um, be you know, two o'clock. But, Johnny, we got to, James talked. Uh, we got to talk to a couple of very interesting, talented, I think, Penn State players. Uh, I would say three of them, really. Three three key players um, in, you know, A.J. Harris, the transfer corner, Denai De Dennis Sutton, 
the uh, the third year defensive end who is now going to be a starter. And don't undersell, you know, Nick Dawkins' impact. I think on the offense this year, the new center uh, replacing Hunter Norzad, Norzad, who replaced Juice Scruggs. That's a big deal. Uh, we heard from James. Let's just start with James. Not that uh, he had a really a ton to say, but when it comes to the blue white game. <laughs> You know, he did say he wants to still have some kind of version of the game and not make it like a glorified practice. But that that, that came out on one side of his mouth. But at the other side of his mouth, he acknowledged they're pretty beat up. And I think that's always going to be the case during spring drills late in the year. Um, you know, they're trying to find out some things. And when they do go live, people are going to get banged up. There weren't there, there were some key players missing at practice. We don't know. Um, we don't know, you know, to what extent they might why they missed it or if they're hurt. But I'm just curious. I mean, I with given with given the fact there's a really good chance, I think, that it might not be much of a game again, just because of the limitations maybe on the roster and also the guys that are healthy, Johnny, the veterans, they're gonna be treated a little bit differently. They don't need to play and at all in the blue white game. So I'm I don't know how much fans can expect to see, but if I was a if I was a fan, Johnny, I think you were in agreement. You'd like you you want to see the the January enrollees and the second year players and, and just see kind of what they look like. Yeah, definitely, Bob. And, and James even mentioned uh, Olu uh, Fashnu in in his press conference when talking about those veterans, those guys who uh, either decided not to go to the NFL and come back for this upcoming season or guys who will have high NFL draft grades going into the 2025 draft that they treat those guys a little bit differently in spring ball in terms of reps, in terms of exposure uh, to potential injuries. Like, you know, put those guys in bubble wrap. Don't let them get hurt. Yeah. Uh, in, in the blue white game, you need to get enough reps to uh, obviously knock the rust off and feel comfortable and grow and develop. Right. But uh, you know, Tyler Warren, for example, <laughs> don't, don't expect to see much of him, especially when you have, uh, you know, Andrew Rappelier, uh, Luke Reynolds, Joey Schlafer, like Jerry Cross, uh, some guys who are going to be fighting for the number three tight end role, for example. Yeah. I mean, Nick Singleton and Katron Allen, like if they take more than three carries or if they suit up at all, like, you know, expect to see a lot of Cam Wallace and, Quentin Martin, I'm really intrigued uh, to see how he fares. The early enrollee running back from Bell Vernon, who, you know, number one player uh, in Pennsylvania, last recruiting class and and could have a role for them this upcoming season. Uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of people will be interested to see if we get a little taste of Abdul Carter at defensive end. If we don't, don't be stunned. Um, yeah. So. I think that's kind of the message where, when James is saying, yeah, we're banged up. There are injuries. Uh, you know, we already know, you know, from the start of spring that Drew Shelton is out uh, until the really the you know, probably the summer and, and training yeah. camp. Uh, yeah. he, James confirmed that Jackson Smolik, the retro freshman quarterback, uh, has you know sustained a significant injury and will be out for a quote unquote period of time. Very mm -hmm. specific. Uh, and uh and then also Alonzo Ford, just a, an under you know, under the radar uh, one, the old Dominion transfer from last off season, uh, didn't play uh, yeah. last year. He's still injured and still working his way back. So yeah, they are banged up, but they also have just a lot of veterans that it doesn't really yeah. make sense uh, to throw them out there. Yeah, Johnny, let me ask you this because I think this is here's a here's a storyline that I think as we get closer to the start of the season and also once the season begins. Um, having as long as I've covered Penn State, it's never quite been like this. And I was kind of, I was kind of counting them up. So I mean, James is talking about you know protecting veterans, guys headed to the NFL, and and totally agree with that. Warren is a, a fifth year player. Olu uh, was a fourth year player last year who was you know a first round pick, and totally understand. But when you really look at Penn State's roster. And you really look at Penn State's 2022 recruiting class, the guys that are going to be either third-year juniors or redshirt sophomores. There are a crap ton of those guys that very likely third-year players are going to be out the door after this coming season if they just take the next progression in their development. You could count them up. It's, it is a lot of players that either played – uh, significant roles as a true freshman, or they just busted out last year. It's a long list, and you just wonder, 
you know, in the age of NIL and in the age of, you know, focusing on the draft, you just wonder kind of what those conversations have been like for James and his staff and these players as they get them ready for one final season, trying to keep them also happy and motivated. But the the blue-white game is not on the priority list, I think, for many of these players. And that, that has not happened at Penn State for a while where – Almost the entirety, other than maybe Tyler Warren, the entirety of the potential 2025 draft class are, is, are probably uh, guys who are going to leave early. And you just wonder how it's going to look like, what's going to look like on Saturday, but also in the fall. It is, it is an impressive 2022 class. No, it definitely is. But I mean, you you talked to Deny Dennis Sutton, and uh, there were so many players from that 22 class. Uh, that that obviously made huge impacts, um, you know, early, you know, in that Rose Bowl season, Penn State winning 11 games. And, you know, they had some seniors on that team, obviously, Sean Clifford, et cetera. But, uh, you know, you could tell early that there were some young players who are now more experienced players um, that that are that are really big impact players for yeah. this team. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm intrigued to see how some of those guys progress. Uh, especially as the 2025 draft looms. We got the 24 draft coming up here, uh, Bob, in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, I, I'm also just intrigued to see which players after, uh, you know, after this spring kind of see the writing on the wall uh, a, a little bit. And, you know, with the, with the conversations that James Franklin and his staff will have with these guys, if they haven't had them already, uh, you know, coming up on Sunday and even Monday with the portal opening next Tuesday, uh, you know, I documented this, I think it was before spring camp, um, that, that Penn State is at, I believe, 99 scholarship players uh, right now. And so the NCAA limit is 85. Uh, so you can do the math there. There's going to be some guys that will have to leave. Now, you know, this is something that James, you know, kind of batted away. And, uh, you know, formally, you know, the coaching staff doesn't deal directly with collectives or anything. But there is a, a trend going on a growing trend, at least in college football, that NIL collectives uh, can sometimes pitch together, you know, money for uh, a player who was previously on scholarship might lose the scholarship, but keep them there and, and help them out and everything. And that kind of, um, you know, helps the numbers game a little bit. Uh, but, you know, without getting too far into that, you're still going to have you know, probably double digit um, amount of players that are going to leave this program in a matter of days uh, when the portal opens. And so, uh, just something to keep an eye on and, and really, all right, who's out there on the field on Saturday, who's not, and is like a veteran and, and a guy that like a Tyler Warren or a Nick Singleton or someone like that and an Abdul Carter, but who's not there at all. Uh, there might be players who just straight up don't show up to the blue white game uh, because they're not going to be a part of this team uh, beyond the next week. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh I think as as this thing evolves, like spring practice and spring, the spring game itself, it, it's just it's just one of those things that I think if you're a Penn State fan and you're you're going to go up to the game to tailgate, I would focus on the tailgating and getting the autographs. If you're going to watch the game, uh, maybe watch it for the first twenty minutes because it's really it's it's not. James was asked about making the game competitive, and he's like, "Oh yeah." I'm trying to make it as competitive as I possibly can between the blue and the white. I don't know the last time I've seen a game that would be called competitive, Johnny. I know you're a gambling man. If you want to, uh, I'm going to set the – I'll give you the white and 17 and a half right now in the game for pretty much any amount of money you want. I'll take the blue side. We can see how it's going to play out. But uh, kidding aside – I do think there is going to be some productive things that come out uh, of the blue-white game. There are positions to be won. There are depth chart spots to be won, even if they're not going to start. Um, the, Janu the January enrollees, a couple of them need to continue to develop. There's going to be some second-year breakouts. Hopefully there won't be any injuries during the game. And, and maybe, if, maybe I buried the lead, but kind of you and I are going to be like, just looking to see if there's any telltale clues about, especially on offense, what the new coordinators are going to try and do differently this year. Yeah. I mean, would it stun me if the offense looked, you know, just similar to last year and there's not much like Andy Kudelnicki isn't going to show his hand. Uh, Cause like you mentioned, big 10 network is, is uh, you know, they're airing this thing. Um, so would it surprise me at all if, 
uh, you know, if the offense is just very vanilla, uh, if the defense, you know, doesn't do anything crazy. Yeah. I mean, again, like you, you don't want to give away too much in April, but at the same time, any little wrinkle uh, that Andy Kotelnicki might throw out there on offense, uh, maybe we do see, you know, for a snap, Drew and Mo mm-hmm. on the field at the same time, just to, you know, plant that little nugget in defensive yeah. coordinators' minds and make them think about it. We had a, uh, some slight technical difficulties here, but I believe they've been cleaned up. We are Johnny McGonigal and I are continuing our conversation about the blue-white game, what it might look like. Johnny has not accepted my offer to take the white plus 17 and a half because I think he is a seasoned, smart betting man, and he knows it's, it's a trap. Because the blue almost always kicks the stuffing out of the white, no matter what James Franklin says. But Johnny, we were just talking about um, maybe the you know uh, Easter eggs or whatever you want to call them. They're not going to show a lot at the blue white game. It's more a chance to see the younger players and to see the future. It's almost always on display if the guys are healthy. But I do think, given the given the turnover on the offensive coordinator and the defensive coordinator. I do think you and I are going to be looking maybe for some 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 wrinkles or some tweaks that may make sense to come to to kind of carry over, you know, when we see Penn State open the season at West Virginia. I just want to start with two things for you and get your reaction. On the defensive side, <clears throat> you know, having had a chance to talk to James about Tom Allen and what he said about Tom Allen and hearing from Tom Allen a couple of weeks ago, um, up there and talking about his defense. It's, it's been very clear to me that he knows his stuff. Uh, Manny Diaz was great. I think they do differ in a couple of areas, and that is perfectly natural. I've always been curious about, you know, everyone's like, well, Tom can't, you know, Tom's no Manny Diaz. But, you know, Tom Allen in his life, Johnny, has never had this kind of talent to work with. So it's not really – a fair comparison just because, you know, Manny Diaz probably never had the talent he had to, and I know he coached at Miami, but I'm telling you, he probably never had this kind of talent to work with either. I do think this about Tom Allen. He is a big nickel package guy. I think Penn state's going to live in a four, two, five or a variation of it. Um, Given the fact that they've made that move with Abdul to the front, I don't know that linebacker is important, but I think you're going to see more defensive backs, Uh, on the field. That's something to look for at the blue-white game. A lot of 4-2-5s. And I think, Johnny, my other thing for you, I want your reaction is we've been talking, unfortunately, about the wide receiver room and James's comments and just about you know, how much better can they get? Will they get? You know, Julian Fleming could be a big part of that. But, you know, given what we saw last year, I just think that if it looks like this year's uh, wide receiver room has improved, but not markedly. If Julian Fleming plays a big role, that's great. If Harrison Wallace is healthy, that's great. But if there, if there's still some uncertainty about the other guys and maybe the top five, because that was a problem. That was a big problem last year. I just think that Andy Kotelnicki strikes me as a guy that says, hey, we can live in 12 personnel, right? Let's just go with two tight ends the majority of the time. If anyone else you know, develops, you know, if, if Tyler, well, if Tyler Warren is healthy and uh, Khalil Dinkins is ready and Andrew Rappelia is ready, let's not, let's not mess around with the wideouts. Let's just load up a tight end and I can be, pre- we, we can certainly be creative enough to make it work that way. So your thoughts maybe on Tom Allen, kind of what he's about, what you're looking for. And, you know, if, if it does look like the wideouts are just a little bit better or about the same as last year, what somebody as creative as Andy Kotelnicki might do moving forward. Yeah, but I'll start with the Tom Allen bit of this on the defensive side of the ball. You mentioned the four two five, the nickel, like that's what he has typically run and would expect, as you said, and I agree with, would expect a hell of a lot more of that uh, in this Penn State defense. I mean, they, they were in it a good bit, um, you know, with Manny yeah. Diaz even sure. you know, going back, right? But that's kind of how football has naturally progressed. Sure. Uh, to that point, but uh, he really uses it. So not only interested to see what the formation, what the scheme itself looks like, but who is filling that role of uh, some people call it a star. Some people call it, you know, I think in his case with Penn State's case, they're, they're calling it the lion uh, position, that extra DB. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked to AJ Harris uh, last night. He said that 
you know, he's played a little bit of it. You know, basically if they need him there, he can play there. Uh, Jalen Reed has played a little bit of it. Wouldn't be surprised if Zachy Wheatley finds his way in there as well. So, um, you know, a lot of talent in the secondary, even with them losing uh, three starting corners, a lot of flexibility, I feel like, in the secondary, which is the biggest thing. Uh, when you're looking at what Tom Allen wants to do yeah. from a defensive perspective. Uh, on offense with Andy, the wide receivers, like it's one of those where you know, and we've talked, we've talked really since Andy got hired about his creativity, his ingenuity, um, you know, the, 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 just the inspired nature of how his offenses play. And I think a lot of people just think that, oh, that's just passing game. That's, you know, just strictly through the air. And it will help. Like, I think he will help Drew Aller and will help these receivers in terms of scheming them open and not just relying on them to beat a guy one-on-one off the line of scrimmage. But a lot of it is also the running game. And we saw that at at Kansas. We saw that at Buffalo. And, you know, Jarrett Patterson, if anyone remembers him, I mean, he had, I think, like 19 rushing touchdowns in a season, uh, you know, well over a 1,000 yards. They might have even had 2,000-yard rushers, uh, if if I'm not mistaken. And so he plays to the strengths of his best players uh, and puts them in best position to succeed. And so that could be Nick Singleton and uh, Katron Allen come the season. On Saturday, it could very well be Quentin Martin. Uh, it could be Khalil Dinkins or even an Andrew Rappel. Yeah, we could see, mm-hmm. uh, you know, him him break out and, and have a good performance. So, yeah, I mean, this is a guy who will play to his strengths. And uh, we might not – I highly doubt we see it you know, at full effect on Saturday at Beaver Stadium. But uh, I would expect that to be the case once they open uh, the season against West Virginia. And then just something on the wide receivers specifically, Bob, because, you know, yeah. it's been a point of – uh, contention, a point of conversation now for well over a year in terms of what they have and what they really don't have from a talent standpoint. And Julian Fleming I- injects a good bit of talent into that room. Uh, Harrison Wallace, uh, like you mentioned, uh, dealt with injuries last year, didn't get to see the best version of him. Uh, we'll see on Keandre Lambert-Smith. Um, and, and then everyone else behind them, uh, you know, it's uh, – it's kind of a free for all, honestly. I mean, like whoever whoever decides to step up and play and and cement a role, like I don't know if that's really even happened so far this spring. Uh, that might have to wait until August training camp. Uh, but you know, count count your blessings if you're Andy Cotal Nikki that you've got Tyler Warren. That's that's what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> we. I'm laughing because you said we might have to wait. Johnny, we wait. We waited through the entirety of the 2023 season, and James obviously never really said, "Hey, uh, he finally stepped up." So and so finally stepped up. That that is my fear this year with the wideout room. Happy to be wrong about it, but I think you know now that you've been around James enough. I've been around him since he's been here. I can. He can read the tea leaves with what he says and what he doesn't say. People think he kind of, but there's a lot of truth to what James says. If you know kind of how to read it, he does divulge stuff without specifically coming right out and saying it. If we are now days away from the blue white game, he has not gone out of his way to say anything about somebody stepping up at whiteout. Let's just, you know, he had a chance last week to talk about Keandre Lambert-Smith when Audrey Snyder asked him about his spring. I would not describe what James said as flattering towards towards Keandre Lambert's development. And we're talking about a fifth-year player. This is not going to go away. Um, The the two X factors to me are the health of Harrison Wallace, because I do think it's fair to say we didn't get a chance to ever see the best of him because he, he just dealt with Injuries, and we just, we just don't know. He's definitely an athlete. And then Julian Fleming. What what can what can what can Penn State do with him? What can they expect from him? But man, the wideout room, boy, I just uh, I, I, all the, everything you said about Andy is it rings true to me, and, and and I agree with it. He is a creative guy, but if if you're limited w- with what you can do with the wideouts, I think it's even going to be a challenge for him, giving some of the teams he's going to have to go against. And I just wanted to say this before we end up this blue white breakdown. Um, I talked about James, you know, and what he says about players. You talked to AJ Harris after practice. You talked to Terry Smith about AJ Harris after practice. James Franklin has been glowing uh, in what he has said about AJ Harris. He did not, he did not say the same things 
about who was the who was the corner that transferred last year? Storm like, dust. Like minutes after after the blue white game ended, he did not quite say anything near that about Storm Duck. So I, it's pretty clear to me that they got they got a dude in AJ Harris, and also, uh, you know, just to get your feelings on this before you talk about AJ. If I was a Penn State fan, I would be investing in a number thirty three jersey this year at Penn State because deny Dennis. Hey, look, Adisa Isaac and Chop Robinson, f- fantastic players, but. Deny Dennis Sutton at 270 pounds. Um, you know, he's going to get more opportunities this year, and I think he's going to run with them. And I just – a lot of the focus has been on Abdul and his transition, and he is a first-team All-Big Ten pick coming back. But I think the only thing that has held Deny back is maybe extra snaps. The guy is a freak, and I am excited – to see some deny Dennis Sutton moving around and and really causing problems, but those two players that we talked to uh, on Tuesday, a big big part of Penn State's present, and I think those guys those guys have a chance to be just when you talk about difference makers in the fall, um, at the very very top of the list. Definitely, I, I mean I, I agree wholeheartedly with you on deny Dennis Sutton, someone that we've talked about now for a while. Like he just. He looked like a man when he came on campus as an 18 year old and, and he's only developed from there. Uh, and he's bound to have a really big 2024 season. And I do think the same for AJ Harris. And, you know, I asked James about him last night, you know, just kind of how, how has AJ acclimated himself after coming in from Georgia? You know, he spent one year there, played in seven games, the first seven games of the year, uh, and then didn't play down the stretch, enter his name into the portal. And James, like you said, Bob was glowing about AJ Harris and about his tenacity, his aggressiveness, his athleticism. Uh, it helps that he's a younger guy too, right? He's yeah. got three years of eligibility here uh, at Penn State. He's a former five-star prospect in the 2023 class, one of the best players in the portal in the winter. And you know, for Penn State to get him, uh, obviously a big deal for them. But it was also just kind of a um, you know a, a job well done by Terry Smith specifically. Yeah. Uh, and and it also just getting him kind of speaks to Terry Smith because when you talk to when you talk to AJ last night, he was talking about his decision to come to Penn State, and he said that you know when he called because Penn State was recruiting him out of high school, uh, and he ultimately goes to Georgia, and when AJ called Terry Smith to say, "Hey, uh, sorry, I'm going to Georgia. I'm not coming to Penn State." You know, some coaches would react really negatively to that. Yeah. Um, just basically say, you know, F you, hang up the phone, I'm done. Uh, that's not what Terry Smith did. Uh, Terry Smith said, you know, wish you good luck and and hope in the future that maybe I'll have have another chance to recruit you. because uh, that's kind of how, how you have to how you have to handle these things. Yeah. Um and, and he did get another chance to recruit him, and that relationship really helped uh bring AJ Harris to uh to campus. And so uh, it is a very interesting mm-hmm. and deep uh, corner room. Uh, Terry Smith said that it might be the deepest corner room that he's had at Penn State, uh, you know, from A.J. Harris and Jalen Kimber, the Florida transfer. You got Cam Miller, who uh, Terry said has established himself as the leader of the room, which is a good sign. Mm-hmm. You've got the two freshmen from last year that played a good bit and Elliot Washington and Zion Tracy. Aldavian Collins is a guy who has really flown under the radar because he hasn't really played all that much, yeah. but uh, the Mississippi State transfer from last offseason uh, has made the biggest uh, improvements this spring, according to Terry Smith, among the corners. So a lot of names to know. Um, and and I just kind of go back to uh, it, it's 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 unfortunate, Bob, that the, that the portal has poisoned my mind this way. But, you know, anytime you're talking to like an assistant coach or James, like you're just thinking about the uh, especially when Penn State's in the scholarship situation that it's in, you're thinking like, OK, well, how might the portal affect this room or how might this yeah. competition affect the, you know, who goes into the portal and, you know, I'm looking at corner, there could be a guy or two that leaves, uh, especially with the amount of younger guys that they just brought in, in this class in the 2024 class. Um, you're looking at wide receiver, uh, fully expect one, two, maybe even three guys uh, leaving that room. And and if that happens and maybe Penn State gets in on another guy and brings yeah. another guy in uh, to help out. Defensive end, like they're going to rotate those guys a lot in Denai and uh, and Abdul, you know, Jamal Lyons, Amin Vanover, Zariah Fisher. But yeah. 
Mariah, Amin, like those guys could start at a number of Power Five programs. Yeah. So uh, just just things to keep an eye on, right? As we watch the blue white game, as this spring ball closes up. And as that lovely transfer portal, Bob, can't wait to have push notifications for all these players and that <laughs> could leave. It's what a wonderful time the transfer portal is. Just just got us got to be something we, we keep an eye on. Very close eye. Johnny, before we close this magical edition of the blue white breakdown, we kind of previewed the blue white game. Kind of Had what? Some technical difficulties, which were my fault, by yeah. the way. Oh, believe me. I have, I, on me. <laughs> Jimmy, I, or, uh, Johnny, I have technical difficulties every day of my life. You're just not here to see them and hear them all. We just caught you. We just caught you at the wrong time. But trust me, uh, they, they're, they're omnipresent in my life. But I just wanted to say, as we wrap up this blue-white breakdown, we get we brace for the portal and some player movement. Um, I'm going to give you one last chance. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer you the white at 18 and a half. 18 and a half, Johnny. No, no, I'm good. I can't I'm go good. any higher. I can't go any higher. You sure? No, I'll, I'll take it at 20 and a half. How about that? No, no. I'm giving you the hook. I'm giving you the three touchdown hook. No. The, my only chance would be a late backdoor touchdown by a quarterback that I don't even know, you know, but with no Jackson Smolik, I'm just, I, I guess we'll see some Grunkenmeyer, but. Yeah, so. so can I count on a late backdoor Touchdown pass from Grunkenmeyer to Liam uh, Clifford. Amari Evans with them down 26. I don't know that I can. I am going to stick with my original blue blowout prediction. I thought I had you on the hook for 18 and a half, but you're thinking great minds think alike. So you're thinking it might even be three touchdowns or more. You're probably right. But I just thought, I just thought if I was on, if I was on FanDuel and I saw the, I saw the blue, Favored by 17 and a half in this game. I probably would have jumped all over it. But you're you're a wise better. You didn't take the cheese. Kudos to you. We any other, any other uh, thoughts? What's we don't even know the teams yet. <laughs> I, I don't need to know the teams. I know how James Franklin thinks. He's going to load the blue wagon, man. The white team is always the, the team with promise. He's going to stack the deck unless he's listening to this. But there's been no bets. The blue team always rules. All I right, think so, yeah. So, so really quick, one just to get back to, to two guys who I wanted to touch on that before we wrap this thing up. You mentioned one of them, Ethan Gronkmeyer. Yeah. Interested to see how the early enrollee quarterback does. Yeah, uh, sure. you know, he was a consensus four star, uh, really blew up in, in his recruitment. Uh, not physically blew up. That would be unfortunate for Ethan, uh, but his recruitment blew up. Uh, and and he, you know, he became a really highly touted guy, Elite 11, uh, interested to see how he looks. And then on the offensive line, someone who we've heard about throughout all of spring. Yeah. Uh, Cooper Cousins. Yep. Uh, as a freshman, very difficult to play as a freshman offensive lineman. Uh, but from everyone that we've heard from, yeah. it's like if, if it's going to be someone that breaks the mold and yeah. and earns a, some kind of role, whether that's a starter role, whether that's a rotational role, uh, as a true freshman offensive lineman, it seems like it could be Cooper Cousins. So uh, he's going to be playing on yeah. Saturday. There, there will be like the offensive lines will will not look like how they're going to look uh, come the, the season opener. At West Virginia, you got Drew Shelton out. You've got some other veterans, you know, J.B. Nelson, Sal Wormley, guys who have missed some time in practice. And uh, so the, the offensive lines for both these teams are, you mm -hmm. know, it's not going to be complete to what Phil Troutwine wants it to be. But Cooper Cousins, keep an eye on him. Big dude. Mountain, mountain of a man. I'm trying to think the last time you – I think you covered this guy. Remember 2016 when they said Connor McGovern was going to start as a true freshman, I think, at guard? I think he started right away. But, I mean, they've, they've played through freshmen before. But mm -hmm. this is – I mean, I don't, I'm not saying these guys are the same player, but, I mean, Co Connor did play a, a ton at Penn State, went on to the league, uh, pretty high draft pick. I forget my Cowboys took him, I think, in the third round. Yeah. But, I mean, this this could be another one of those deals. The difference is I think Connor played because they had a real need because they were still building depth, whereas Cooper, maybe he could play, but they are much, much, much deeper – along the offensive line and the opportunity really probably isn't there for him. But I mean, if they switch roles, if, if you, if you transported Cooper to 2016, Connor to this year, I think, I think Cooper Cousins starts at Penn state and probably Connor gets worked along slowly and plays maybe at a little this year and, and pushes to start next year. What do you think about that, Johnny? What do you have that comp? 
Maybe. I, I kind of like it, Bob. Yeah. And listeners, depending on when you're listening to this, you might, you know, if you're listening to it on Thursday or Friday, uh, my my Nittany Lions to watch in the blue white game will already be on penlive.com. And you could bet the Cooper Cousins will be on that list. Yeah. So there's, there's you have like 25 of them, Johnny. Is it 25 or 30 of them? No. <laughs> no. You're too smart. You're no. wise. No, that's that's insane. We're 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 not doing that. Um, you want me? You know what I could do, Bob? I could just like take a picture of the roster, and then just embed it into a story and just be like, "Here are the Nittany Lions to watch," and here's like all 130 players on the roster. You know, walk I, on. I, we are going to be curious because I think they they drop the actual blue and white rosters like Friday afternoon, and you yeah. and I are going to have a little text exchange when you see what James has done to the poor white team. Versus the poor blue team. It's not fair. He says he's trying to make it competitive. This is one time I'm not buying what James Franklin is saying. I think it's the blue team. It's the blue team's game to lose, baby. I'll offer you twenty and a half. No, that's right. You're not. You're not doing that. Uh, this started out as me offering you, yeah, uh, white, and you're not. You're not turning the tables on me. I'm a master negotiator, Bob. I might take twenty two and a half if we keep talking, but right now it's no sale. Fair enough. I think it might be time to wrap it up then. Yep. All right, let's do it. Look forward to seeing you on Saturday, Bob, and uh, look forward to lo- really looking forward to the portal opening next Tuesday. Cannot wait. At this time, you at this point, you might just want to stay up and and stay at college. You've been there. You've been there like for five straight days. The game's only it's, it's like seventy two hours. You could just stay up there, Johnny, if you want. I could. I could. I'm going to be heading back to Philly though, and then we'll be seeing you. In the press box on Saturday at Beaver Stadium. Looking forward to it. All right. You got it, Johnny.